Always frame your aspirations in terms of the well-being of the entire country. If you are in the street, you may be subject to arrest for disorderly conduct. I think the answer has always been we're going to save ourselves, but I think it's partially because we're going to see ourselves. This is something that people would look at this and see an ordinary block of wood. Sometimes young people don't see the potential in themselves. The next Albert Einstein might be born anywhere in America. So we're now in a period of time when people think that we are in a second Gilded Age, uh, a second era of massive inequality um, uh, on the economic level, at the level of political power as well. Uh, and that's really shifted how our country works and how our economy works. I just think that we have undervalued the possibilities and the political power of higher education as a tool of social change. And right now, one of the greatest achievements we could pull off as a society is if we were able somehow to transform our higher education system into a genuine ladder of economic opportunity, regardless of a student's economic background. Higher education changed everything about my life. Oh, say does that my ancestors in this country came here um, as chattel slaves, so to be able to step foot on a university and understand um, the power that that education has to unlock my potential, to change the trajectory of my life, is something that I think we need to embrace. My wish is just, you know, higher education manifests the hopes and dreams of every American, of every person living in this country. We have a situation now in the United States where 90% of the students who graduate from our colleges and universities are from above the median income. 70% of the students who are admitted to our colleges and universities are from above the median income. This is completely contrary to the idea of providing higher education across the board to all intellectually capable people. We already know that the greatest performers in our history quite often come from humble backgrounds. Frederick Gauss, for example, he was responsible for the bell curve. His parents were peasants. John Bell, the celebrated physicist who solved the question between Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein about whether God plays dice with the universe. His father was a horse trader. We're losing as a nation the opportunity to foster innovation and fully develop human capital. We're saying that the poorest people, it doesn't matter. The only people that can think and invent and create and participate are the richest people. This is a mistake in empathy across our society. It's a mistake in terms of human capital development. It's a big mistake in terms of innovation. We need a system that recognizes the simple fact regardless of who your deity happens to be, whether it's evolution or a singular god, that Deity does not allocate intellectual potential by looking at the parent's checkbook. If we want to develop our human capital to the fullest extent possible, we need a system that's prepared to educate people irrespective of economic background. We've seen that the people in power want to guard the higher education system to be a privilege for their own children and uh, to exclude all the rest. For all their talk about education being the great equalizer and, and anyone can make it if you just try hard, uh, in fact, we see in reality the, the practices that they employ are about building walls around higher education to keep out uh, low-income students and black and brown students. When we look at how our educational system has been set up and how it's been going, it's always been catered to white elites. It's basically a new Jim Crow. So as, as our population has 
changed. You're going to have a declining percentage of people who are getting educated. And this is part of our problem. Why other countries have caught up and now surpassed us is that they are, they are looking at educating everybody and we're still concentrating on educating people of means. We're definitely failing students of color in this circumstance. Favoring wealth in our education system is systemically racist, plain and simple. The data are straightforward. The wealth of white and Asian families is 10 times greater than it is for black and Hispanic families. If an education system is driven by wealth, it automatically and systemically favors white and Asian people. That's a fundamental problem. The enemy is not trade with other nations. The failure of leadership is to point the finger at China, to point the finger at Germany or Mexico. Certainly the trade deficit is a problem. The United States in 2017 disgorged 500 billion net to other countries, primarily China. That's a disgorging of wealth. But inside this country, we have a transfer of wealth that's three times worse. If we look at the top 10% of the wealthiest people in this country versus the bottom 90%. The top 10% of the people control 75% of this nation's wealth. The bottom 90% control 25% of the wealth. The delta, the gap between those two piles of, of wealth grew by $3.4 trillion in 2017. That's tantamount to a transfer of $1.7 trillion from the bottom 90% of this population to the top 10%. Three times greater than the trade deficit. This is the problem that our administration, that our politicians need to focus on. Part of the solution is providing education, higher education, to the broadest population possible. We are moving towards a society that in some senses resembles feudalism, tremendous concentration of wealth and power in very few hands. You can't just allow one or two companies to own vast industries which are transformative over the entire society. You just, you know, you're, you're going to end up with a neo-gilded age. The very richest people back in Columbus's time, all they could do is send off a bunch of wooden ships over the horizon and wait several months to hear what might happen. Now we have billionaires who can send vehicles to space and be in instant communication. Uh, the power of the rich by virtue of technology is vastly greater than at any time in human history. The, yet the poorest people today are just as poor as the poorest people in Columbus's time. So the gap between them and the very richest is vastly greater today than at any time in human history. We have this critical problem of growing gap between rich and poor. Luckily, however, we hold the keys to solving it because we are in the learning age. And if we can redistribute access to higher education, if we can make that opportunity available, regardless of family wealth, we have a chance to solve this great problem, this historic problem. We cannot go on ignoring inequality because we have the means to destroy our world, but not to escape it. Stephen Hawking was the first public intellectual to connect the dots to see that the problem of inequality could translate into the end of the species. As he said, we can't escape the planet. We have to solve the problem of inequality. This may be the most important insight that Stephen Hawking had. We need to create the world's first soft landing for economic divergence and concentration of power. We live in a nuclear age, and wars aren't settled peaceably. The body count keeps going up throughout history, from revolution to revolution to revolution. If you look at, at maps of Europe, say, in 1919, after the Paris Peace Conference, most uh, of Europe turned into liberal democratic states. By 1929, when the Great Depression strikes, those democratic states turn to the right. And by the end of the 1930s, we had fascism nearly everywhere. <laughs> So from basically the ancient Greeks and Romans all the way up till the founding generation, people believed that it was not possible to have a republic, a constitutional democracy, 
without having a degree of economic equality. If you had deep economic inequality, either the rich would oppress the poor or the poor would try to overthrow the rich. And you would have violence, you'd have instability, you'd have revolutions. Whenever there's a growing gap between rich and poor, the only thing that levels it is war and conflagration. The founding of this nation was triggered by a rebellion against the taxes imposed by the wealthy elites in Britain. And so again and again, when there's extreme inequality, something breaks that balance that supports social justice. What has happened to the American dream? I think the American dream is lost. I think, uh, for the most part, we don't even talk about what is the American dream. And it's very different from when I was growing up. But what's not working? It's not redistributing opportunity. We can call it a wealth gap. You can call it an income gap. And so I think that if I was the president of the United States, or it has to come from the top, what I would do is recognize that this is a national emergency. An important thing to help us understand what's going on in our world is a simple metaphor, a metaphor of a balance. Think about a simple balance scale with one scale on the right and one scale on the left. And in the middle is this post called social justice. And that social justice post can break if one side of the scale overweights. We can also think about wealth and income inequality as weighting against social justice. Through technology, we're able to add more and more of these compensating levelers that don't actually, in fact, compensate. They provide the illusion of parity and power for the masses. We have, for example, one man, one vote. Seemingly, this uh, gives us all a fair shake in the political outcome. It doesn't match the economic power of the Jeff Bezos's, the Larry Page's, the Elon Musk's of the world the Bill Gateses of the world, they have so much economic power that it doesn't matter how many guns you buy, that's not gonna change the fact that you're still poor. In the earlier times, in the Middle Ages, the counterweight was the pieties of the time, the belief that it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. God favors all people equally. The Lutherans in the Middle Ages were the radicals of their time they were armed with pitchforks, rebelling against the system of indulgences that piled on yet more advantage to the already wealthy class. 50,000 of them died in the uprising. They were rebelling against the concentration and the perversion of power. In order to solve the problem of economic opportunity in this era, it's different than it used to be in the agrarian era. In the middle 1800s through the Homestead Act, the United States gave out in the form of opportunity over 10% of the land mass of this country. That was the currency of opportunity in the agrarian age. Today, it's different. It's not the agrarian age. It's not in the industrial age. It's not even the knowledge age. It's how quickly you can adapt to change. It's how quickly, in essence, you can learn. We have the currency of the age. It's the capacity to learn, the capacity to pivot, the capacity to think critically. These are the great currencies of wealth for the future. It's the ability, like Francis Bacon said, to take the pollen and nectar and to transform it into honey. That's the power that we have in a world that changes very quickly. It's the power to take new information and to combine it creatively into the next innovation or the next solution the ability to question your own received ideas. The university is the best place to widely spread that sort of skill and capability. That's the currency for the age that we are in, this new learning age. A lot of people move their way up without doing the hard work that money matters more uh, than hard work and diligence, which goes against the idea of the American dream, right? The American dream tells us that you can come to this country and do anything and move up through your hard work. And that seemed, the educational system seems to sort of move in the opposite direction. You have to start with money. What a lot of the political scientists have shown over time is that our federal government is largely responsive to the wealthiest people and to corporate interest groups far more than being responsive to the general public. Um, and that's a real problem. And so, you know, people out there who think that the system is rigged, um, 
think it's rigged for a reason, and they're right. Usually we think of rigging when a few individuals work against a virtuous system and they're detected and caught. That's the way you solve the problem. You find the miscreants and you prosecute them. We're here today to announce charges in the largest college admissions scam ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. Between roughly 2011 and 2018, wealthy parents paid about $25 million in total to guarantee their children's admission to elite schools. The parents charged today, despite already being able to give their children every legitimate advantage in the college admissions game, instead chose to corrupt and illegally manipulate the system. The Varsity Blue scandal serves a bad effect if what it does is suggest that by simply curing the most egregious malefactions, we're going to solve the problem of the rigging of the higher education system for the wealthy. We are not going to solve that problem if we get distracted by a few egregiously bad actors, no pun intended. I was wryly amused by the fact that the lead prosecutor said, this isn't like donating a building. This is outright fraud. We're not talking about donating a building so that a school's more likely to take your son or daughter. We're talking about deception and fraud. So in other words, it's okay to donate a building to get your way into college. There's this admission from the prosecuting attorney that it's okay to buy your way in. You just have to do it in a way that's legit. When I first heard about that, I was so mad. It's some bullshit. I'm out here suffering with these SATs. They just like to keep the power secluded amongst themselves to rig it. These people are taking spots from others who deserve it more. Well, my mom called me crying because I applied to UCLA. And my mom's like, what if that could have been one of the reasons why you didn't get in? So the fact that these people were paying their way for like the experience of college, for like the parties and this and that. It's just like a slap in the face to students who work so hard, who come from low income areas and don't get into schools like that. This system is rigged in favor of the rich, and as a consequence, it's systemically racist. But it's not that way because of some violation of the prevailing ethos. Like, for example, an election gets rigged because there are a couple bad actors who decide they're going to play with the voting machines or they're going to improperly influence or pay their way to a result that violates the public will. That is a circumstance of rigging that's easier to solve. The problem in higher education is different. The problem of higher education is, has been a slow, acquiescent change in the ethos of the collective that says that wealth in higher education is better. This is a harder problem to fix because it requires the collective shift its value system from focusing on wealth as the barometer of goodness to a barometer that says the provision of opportunity is the measure of goodness. It's not that we have a virtuous system that a few people are trying to cheat. It's that the system itself is cheating us as a society of the opportunity for social mobility. What we need to do to correct the problem is to transform the basic value system by which we operate our higher education system. We can no longer acquiesce to the value system summarized by U.S. News & World Report that says that schools that have more wealth are schools that are quote unquote better. In the 1970s, the prevailing attitude in higher education was that business was evil and that students should be concerned with important social issues like apartheid in, in uh, South Africa and, and Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. Well, anyway, uh, in the 1980s, the Reagan era, as the mood of the country changed, large numbers of, of people simply said, well, I'm not interested in that stuff, that I'd like to go into business, I'd like to make money. People became more and more attracted to prestigious colleges. And because of, of this phenomenon, somebody at the US News and World Report had a good idea. Why don't we rate the, the colleges? It attracted a lot of interest. And then in 1987, they, they made it annual. They used metrics like 
the opinions of, uh, of these colleges by other college leaders. They use metrics like how many alumni are donating to the school, uh, which are really all proxies for kind of a, a very uh, nebulous quality called prestige. If you look at the U.S. News and World Report top 50, and the top 50 institutions for family income, you find that 70% of that second list is the same as the first list of the so-called top U.S. News and World Report schools. And if you do the same thing with respect to endowment, you have a 70% overlap. The value system calls a university best or prestigious is basically a proxy for wealth. The U.S. News and World Report survives in part because it's always had its fingers to the wind of the ethos of higher education. U.S. News and World Report started 100% based upon surveys of university presidents. All it was was a mirror for what the university presidents said constitute the best colleges and universities. And to this day, 30% of the U.S. News and World Report metric is tied up in opinion surveys of college and university presidents. U.S. News World Report isn't so much a culprit as it is a mirror for the culprit, and the culprit is this ethos in higher education that's biased towards the wealthy. Things that stand between my students and achieving greatness is the system. I want people to understand that my students are capable that my students are worthy, that my students are just as talented as any other student around. And that's what I really want people to know. It doesn't matter the community we come from. It doesn't matter how we talk, how we walk, what type of music we listen to. All my students are brilliant. They are all resilient, and they are all capable of doing whatever it is they want to do in life. As colleges and universities, we have to figure out how are we student ready? Not how the students are ready for us, but how are we ready for the students and how are we responding to their needs and their situations? And we have to change the way we think about how we're serving students uh, or we're not gonna survive. It's clear in any ranking system, in any kind of goal for a university, it's essential to graduate students. This is a paradox, though, with respect to solving the problem of economic inequality, because the best prepared students, of course, are the students who come from the wealthiest families. So it makes institutions risk adverse. Schools need to gamble on student services. They need to gamble on the willingness to educate as opposed to select from our population. As institutions compete for more and more prestige, one of the ways, strangely, is to reject more students. If I'm XYZ University and I can say that I reject 90% of the applicants to my institution, that now is considered to be a marker for prestige or goodness or popularity. The reality is any given student has more chance to get one of those seats if he or she applies to all schools. And that's exactly the kind of thing that's occurring. The number of applications that are filled out by students today has skyrocketed to the point where if you have to pay a $50 bill to apply to a given school, students now are applying to 15, 20 institutions. So before they even consider going to college, if they want to compete, they're looking at a $500 to $1,000 bill simply to fill out admissions applications. Now, this is a game that favors the rich. It turns an application form into a kind of lottery ticket. The kid who can purchase 10 lottery tickets has an advantage over the kid who can only purchase two. There was a study recently that said a family facing a sudden $400 emergency would find itself in serious jeopardy. Well, if you have to fill out 10 applications to colleges at 50 bucks a whack, you're looking at a $500 emergency. But what's most problematic about lust for increasing applications is that it provides a justification for higher tuition. Coincident with the advent of the U.S. News and World Report ranking, the acceptance of the dictum issued by Milton Friedman, which is that the sole purpose of a corporation is to maximize shareholder value. If you take an executive from one of the companies who lives, eats, and breathes that ethos, and you place him or her as a trustee at a university, isn't he or she going to naturally make the same kind of decisions? When you drive application volume and it gets to the desk 
of one of these trustees, they're gonna look at it like a business issue. They're gonna say, look, I've got all these applicants. That's a wide open invitation to raise the price. And that's exactly what schools have done. The universities have driven the rate of application per student higher and higher and higher, which by the time it gets to the trustees, convinces the trustees that they have headroom, that they have what's called price elasticity to grow tuition, which further exacerbates the problem of social mobility. The purveyors of application processing are declaring virtue. Hey, more students applying to college, there's more access, there's more choices. This is all good for the higher education system. It isn't, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. It's allowing the system to persist. The most important problem with tuition isn't tuition per se. It's the fact that at the end of the process, when a student graduates, he or she is starting out at a position that is far, far, far diminished compared to his or her parents. Higher education has placed a 1.6 trillion ankle brace on the middle class. Given that upward mobility means advancing beyond the economic quintile of your parents, today at the starting line right after college, as a young indebted middle class graduate, you are immediately way behind your parents. And like your parents, you are sitting in a debt hole way deeper than anything they could have ever imagined. Compare your position to that of the graduate whose rich family paid off their college bill. That rich graduate starts adult life at a huge advantage with zero debt. There are many schools which will tout their Pell percentage as an indicator of, of how well they're serving students from disadvantaged backgrounds. But if you want to look at the Pell Grant as an indicator of, is this school enrolling students from disadvantaged backgrounds, from low-income families, it's not a good indicator of that anymore. It's no longer the case when you say, as an admissions director, that you have 10% more Pell Grants, that that means you've provided economic inclusion for the poorest segments of our population. There are some Pell Grant recipients coming from families making over $100,000 a year. So you can't simply count Pell Grants or look at percentages of Pell Grant changes as an indicator of virtue. In the early stages of this system, they were indeed awarded only to the poorest of the poor. Since that's changed, it's no longer proper as a researcher to be measuring the relative economic inclusion of institutions by how many Pell Grants the institution awards. That's now a bogus measure. Any of these claims to virtue for the current system actually deter our chances of changing the system. A personal financial statement defines net worth as that person's assets versus their liabilities. But only a fool would claim that economic net worth defines a person's goodness and value. Instead, any measure of a person's goodness counts what that person delivers for their family, their children, their society, and the future. In the words of Martin Luther King, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. The true neighbor will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others. If this value distinction is so obvious for individuals, then why isn't it obvious for institutions of higher education? The idea that the goodness and value of an institution correlates to its wealth is the philosophy of wealthism. By favoring and advantaging those with wealth and thus deprecating educational opportunity for poorer families, U.S. higher education is systemically racist. Wealthism at the core of our higher education system continuously broadcasts an insidious, misguided lesson at odds with Dr. King's legacy. As a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice, while the most overt promoter of the wealthiest model for U.S. higher education is U.S. News & World Report, it is the chronicle of higher education that undergirds and reinforces wealthism in our higher education system. If we call its advertising copy and editorial for the words elite, prestige, selective, ranked, and peer, the resulting concordance would count more such words than any other publication on earth. 
The Chronicle of Higher Education successfully chronicles the actual state of our U.S. higher education system, not because it is practicing journalistic excellence or delivering cogent fourth estate critique of the large nonprofit agencies behind the wealthest model, but because it is itself profiting handsomely by placing safely themed, easy to read articles on systemic racism between paid advertisements in which schools brag to each other about their relative position and virtue in the wealthest system. When I was in college, I spent the best years of my life learning from other folks who did not look like me. It helped me become more humane. It helped me in every aspect of my life to be able to learn from folks from other places, to experience other cultures and the vastness of our world. Higher education brings folks together from everywhere. Why, why are we excluding the folks on the ground who need these opportunities the most and who we can learn from the most? Diversity is thought of as a, a sop to social justice. It's believed that, oh, well, we should include people because, after all, everybody should have an opportunity. But what we fail to understand is a higher value to diversity, and that is that it creates the fertile territory for gestation of critical thought. When you are at an institution and you're with people who aren't like you, for whatever reason, because they've come from a different economic background, because they have a different gender, because they have a different sexual orientation, a different political idea, the chances that you will collide, the chances that your ideas may be called out and challenged, go up. And that's very, very important in terms of establishing the deepest, most advanced type of critical thought, which is the ability to look at your own ideas and question them and change them. You can learn two ways. You can learn by adding to your brain the things that you know, but you can also, importantly, add to your capacity by changing the things you think you already know. That's when real innovation occurs. That's advanced critical thought. By way of example, those born in the Middle Ages who eventually discovered and determined that the sun was at the center of the solar system, they weren't born that way. They were born like everybody else to look at the obvious data the sun coming up in the east and setting in the west. It's obvious, the sun moves, the earth is stable. It was up to those middle-aged scientists to look at the data and challenge their own received wisdom. They turned the arrow of skepticism at their own brain. This is when invention occurs. Encountering data that's different than your experience and being receptive to it is the greatest opportunity, is the greatest soil for innovation, the greatest soil for creative thought. That's why economic inclusion is so important for a university. It improves the academic environment because it creates the opportunity for more diverse and unexpected experiences for all students. The students at elite institutions are being robbed of opportunity. This is important to understand with respect to innovation. The greater the diversity of ideas, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to combine ideas in an unexpected way. An institution that provides a broad array of experiences, unexpected experiences, unexpected collisions between rich and poor, black and white, is an environment where it's more likely that all individuals at that institution can pull a far richer experience and potentially become more effective innovators. The most important thing you can possibly pull out of your education is the capacity to doubt your own ideas. If you collide, with individuals who come from different backgrounds, who have a different viewpoint, who have a different history, there's a better chance that you're gonna think critically about the way you look at the world. Throughout the Vietnam War, there was plenty of critical thinking happening on university campuses about our society. We were thinking about the wrong-headed policies of the Vietnam War. There was concern about the environment. The first Earth Day emerged from the college and university environment. But all of that criticality was directed outward. The great challenge we have now is to understand that the criticality on the campus has to be directed back at the campus and the campus's role and inequality in our society. That's a big challenge. That's a big lift 
That's asking universities to turn their criticality inward at their own role in society. So I want to talk about the complicated narrative of why it's important for students from marginalized backgrounds to be at elite universities, because there's sort of two narratives around that, and they sometimes conflict with each other. One is that it's important for people to have access so that we can shift kind of the composition of who are who is it that's making policy decisions, who is it that's doing research, who is it that gets to be an expert on their topic. Um, and I think that's really important. The other side of the access for first-gen and or low-income students to elite education is to inform their peers and sometimes their staff and faculty about the limitations of their purview, their positionality, their perspectives. Just like it's dangerous to feel inferior because of the education you got, it's dangerous to feel superior because of the education you got because it creates a false sense of who you are. That's dangerous. And it's the reason why to this day, we still have these problems in this country around how we view each other because I, the vast majority of us, grossly miseducated, grossly miseducated. Everybody loses when an institution is economically homogenous. The elite of the elite lose the chance to experience those collisions, collisions that are exceptionally enriching, not only in terms of potential for innovation, but also in terms of the potential for building empathy this is a mistake, an educational mistake. It is also a mistake that redounds to our society given that elite institutions are the sources for our judges, for our think tanks, even for our legislature. For example, in the 2016 election, 50% of the freshman class of the Congress came from elite institutions. And we usually take solace in the idea that our judiciary doesn't have such pollution in terms of their perspective. The lack of heterogeneity, economic heterogeneity, in a university, especially what we traditionally call an elite university, reduces severely the chances that those kinds of diverse and inclusive and informed minds will populate our judiciary. The law is based on precedent, and that precedent is subject to interpretation. So the modern lens that we apply to interpreting the law is shaped by our own perceptions. It's very, very important that the people who populate that branch are people who can see through a lens that's informed by experiences of all classes of people. When economic homogeneity reigns at our elite institutions, don't be surprised when a graduate tracks from the privileged high school, the tennis courts, the Columbia education to the Supreme Court, that that individual won't be able to empathize with the plight of the working class or the plight of the poorest people. It's very, very important for the safety and security and inclusiveness in our society that all actors, all students, have the opportunity and exposure to see the world differently, see the world through the eyes of the great diversity in this country. You can think about that as another way in which the system is already rigged against people of color and against economic minorities. The people who would challenge this, the people who would create laws, the people who could reconfigure the way in which we distribute public monies for education, they themselves are unlikely to think critically about their own institution. It's almost as though you fill up a stadium and call it Elite U and then draw from it for our government. And they're cheering for their home team. They're not likely to be able to say, unless they are able to jump that bar of critical thought, hey, even though I went to XYZ elite school, unless that elite school starts to address equality of opportunity, we should remove their tax exemption for endowment. We should no longer allow them to receive tuition support in the form of undifferentiated Pell Grants. We no longer should provide for tax-exempt contributions to those institutions. Those institutions should not be receiving these public benefits unless they're participating in addressing this fundamental problem. The real question should be, why does 1% own all this wealth and the rest of us are struggling? That's the real question. These disparities in wealth, the disparities in educational opportunities, even the disparities in 
career and job possibilities afterwards feeds into the hatred, the violence, the fear, the division, because as we're all going through this, we start blaming each other. When you don't properly give people access to educational opportunities, to life opportunities, that's when they start destroying themselves and each other in record numbers. And that's where we are now. And that's not a civilization. That's something else. Throughout history, it doesn't matter whether it's a monarchy, whether it's a capitalist society, whether it's a socialist society, whether it's a communist society, it doesn't matter if wealth concentrates that sets the tinder for revolution. The large swath of the public says, we're fed up, we're not gonna live with it anymore. We're gonna change and rebel. The same thing happens again and again and again throughout history, irrespective of the economic system that predominates. This is what we're moving towards here in the United States. We're moving towards a circumstance where wealth is becoming so concentrated that it's providing tinder for revolution. There's a vulnerability in our constitutional system. It's a vulnerability to the predations by the wealthy. This is the only constitution in Western civilization that doesn't contemplate a struggle between rich and poor. There's no House of Lords, there's no House of Commons. And at the time that this constitution was constructed, this was a relatively equalitarian society, as de Tocqueville opined and wrote for his French audience. If somebody felt that they didn't have economic advantage, they could go west, young man. And that was an important difference that existed then and now. And the equivalent now, the equivalent opportunity that we can provide in this learning age is not land, it's access to education, access specifically to higher education. This is the great equalizer that we can restore to allow our constitution to flourish. A lot of the political debate, a lot of the philosophic debate that we have in the world is around my system is going to cure the problem. My democratic approach is going to do better than your socialist approach and so on. The fact is none of these systems is self-purifying. None of these systems is automatically exempt from the potential for concentration of power. And one of the great insights that is only five or six years old, came out of the work of Thomas Piketty, where he was able to show us that if you look at the national income for a given society, there's a capital component and there's an income component from wages, from labor. If the capital component gets bigger and bigger over time, that causes concentration of wealth because the people who own the capital are the richest people in society. We didn't understand it five or six years ago. We thought that the tension of capitalism existed between the productivity of labor and the wages of labor. That was Marx's theory. His idea was that at a given factory, productivity is naturally going to increase because people become more skillful. And as productivity increases, if wages don't also commensurately increase, that causes the capitalists who own the factory to become richer and richer at the expense of the people who are working. That's the way the fundamental tension was framed prior to Piketty, the fundamental tension of capitalism. But what we understand through Piketty now is that the basic tension, the basic divergent force in economics and capitalism is the growth of the capital portion of income, of national income. This state had about 200,000 cars 1929, it has a million cars now. They weren't built in this state. They were built in Detroit. As this state's income rises, so does the income of Michigan. Then as the income of Michigan rises, so does the income of the United States. A rising tide lifts all the boats. Kennedy's often misquoted by economists even, professional economists who say that, well, if the GNP goes up, a rising tide lifts all boats. That's great. No, that's not true. When GNP goes up, when gross national product goes up, as Piketty has shown, it could be the case that the capital component of that growth grows substantially faster than the labor component of that income growth. The history of Kennedy's quote is his dedication of a dam in Arkansas. Which is more wasteful? To let the land wash away, to let it lie arid, or to use it and use it wisely? and to make those investments which will make this a richest state and country in the years to come. 
It was a dam that provided jobs. It's a dam that provided water and electricity for everyone. It was an investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure has the effect of, in fact, being a rising tide that lifts all boats. The road system, for example, the telephone system, for example, all of these things benefit all of us as citizens. Higher education is of the same type. It's an infrastructure spending, which if distributed across our population, can in fact be a rising tide that lifts all boats. A relatively new area of research in U.S. higher education is called undermatching. Although this work encourages many schools to improve their economic inclusiveness, it has the unfortunate side effect of pushing into the academically respectable the assumption that wealthier schools are better just because U.S. News and the public happen to believe they are. The premise behind undermatching research is twofold. The first premise is that economically disadvantaged students with high SAT scores should apply to more selective institutions because they'd be better off. In other words, if a student can attend Harvard, but instead chooses Western Michigan, she has now lost economic advantage. The second premise is that the student is thereby undermatched because the lower tiered school is inferior under the wealthiest model and therefore supposedly cannot as fully develop her academic potential. But here the economically disadvantaged student may actually know more than the undermatching researchers who are studying her. And that is because while enrolling as high up as possible in the wealthiest pecking order does in fact confer an economic benefit upon graduation, there is zero research to support the idea that going to school with richer kids also confers more educational benefit. The fundamental theorem of calculus is the same in all math texts, regardless of the institution. Further, since the culture of selective institutions often emphasizes the prestige of faculty research over the importance of teaching, the ambitious student may surmise that she will have more access to faculty if she attends a school that prides itself less on selecting and more on educating. She may also think that in the event of a health or economic crisis hitting the family, which is far more likely to occur for the economically disadvantaged, she will have more options to help them by attending a state school closer to home, including figuring out a way to eventually complete her education. And so in all of these ways, economically disadvantaged persons may actually be wiser than the elite researchers who are studying them. There are many universities, fortunately, that are outliers with an ecosystem biased in favor of the wealthy, institutions that understand that their role, as Michael Denon says at University of California, Irvine, is to construct multiple entry points for the same world-class result. We select for the capacity and the willingness and the grit and the desire to learn. Regardless of where that step happens to be, we are gonna work in partnership with that student to a world-class result. The schools that are leading the way are the institutions that are meeting students where their needs happen to be. They're not trying to cookie cut a single entry point for all students. SAS is a UC David critical literacy program that uses poetry, spoken word, and hip hop to help young people to get through school and go on the path to higher education. SES comes in with people that are from your same neighborhood, look like you, talk like you, walk like you, and have advanced degrees, and tell you, don't lose who you are. I just want y'all to be the best versions of yourself, okay? And I've been in your seat and made mistakes and thought I had it all together. No, I'm pointing right over here. Um, and I just don't want y'all to have to make the mistakes that Ms. Coco and I are doing. Most of the time, the young people we work with, they never been to UC Davis. So when they come into SES, they're being told um, on a daily basis at school, you can do this. Th here's the tools. Here's the application. Here's the personal insight questions. Um, Coco and I are going to help you write your personal statement. Here's the FAFSA deadline. And we're using community building activities, field trips to the university, going to different conferences. They're really getting to see how the university, the community, and the city connects. 
I think that, you know, we've gotten better at developing cohort models for students that get onto the college campus because oftentimes, you know, students feel tokenized, imposter syndrome. I mean, all these things that happen, especially when you go to a predominantly white institution, you might have been from one of these neighborhoods where you didn't even have white kids in your class, and now all of a sudden you're hit with the kind of cultural mismatch, and you need a community. And so we started having these open mics on campus. And we finna have fun tonight, so I hope y'all ready. Is y'all ready? The open mic is a partnership with the Mandavi. The Mandavi Center is the performance art building on campus. You do not know the violence it took to be this gentle. Everything you want is out there. It's just up to you to find it. It brings a new dynamic to UC Davis. It's a place for a lot of students to say what they need to say. And if you record my son's death or watch my daughter take her last breath, just know that you are as guilty as the press that decides which bodies are newsworthy. Y'all, that was history right here on this open mic. Poetry allows them to speak truths um, that they otherwise haven't been given the opportunities to do. They are our truth tellers. Young people tell the truth no matter what, no matter if we like it or not. And you know, what we do with that truth um, is up to us to manifest the world we wanna see for them. The things that stand between my students and achieving greatness is the system. But you just have to push through and you have to navigate through and you have to believe in yourself to be able to navigate out of poverty. That you want to change? What are some problems, some things in the world you see that you would like to change? Systematic oppression. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> What's the acronym? Spell it, baby. However, you yeah, spell it spell how. It. Just let her spell it how she spelled it. We gonna be forever doing that. Systematic um, what? Oppression. I want people to understand that my students are capable that my students are worthy, that my students are just as talented as any other student around. And that's what I really want people to know. It doesn't matter the community we come from, it doesn't matter how we talk, how we walk, what type of music we listen to. All my students are brilliant, they are all resilient, and they are all capable of doing whatever it is they want to do in life. So there's this thing in SES that we use to identify uh, the students we work with. We, we refer to them as warrior scholars. And the idea of a warrior scholar is no matter what your background is, no matter what you've been through, we help to bring out that inner you that you've been holding inside, getting through that. In 2008, Black and brown youth were not passing the California high school exit exam, and they weren't passing at rates of like 70%. So that was the conversation. That was the, the word around town. If I talked to a superintendent, they were telling me about it. Talked to families, youth. I mean, it was just this pervasiveness. These students, they come in a certain way to where they thought college was not an option. Now these same students is graduating from college. And it's the idea that school is my hustle. When I heard that, that philosophy, it just, it just spoke to me. It's heroic, the notion and deeds of a poet. The system is weak, so the people overthrow it. Hear no evil, speak truth. There's power in my voice, so I'm speaking to empower the youth. Says motivated me. God gave me a vision, now I'm on a mission to uplift little ghetto children, gritting and grinding, turning books into dollar signs. School became my hustle. I started flexing my muscle. I got into Davis. A little younger girl made it. Start gazing. But college can be a yin and yang situation. Yet they call UC Davis the land of opportunity. No one it might physically, mentally, and spiritually ruin me, but yet I unlock the doors to explore the Aggie world. Welcome to UC Davis. Y'all ready to get this thing started? It's more expensive to invest in meeting the students at the point where he or she happens to need your help than it is to assume that all students are fungible.
A 17-year-old, an 18-year-old brain is still growing. The growing of the human brain continues through age 26, and plasticity in the human brain persists well beyond that throughout a person's life. Understanding that people are different not only contributes to encouraging and embracing the opportunity for diversity and heterogeneity in the academic experience, it accords with the physical fact that brains grow at different paces. Universities like uh, Winston-Salem State, which is a historically black college and university, increasingly more important because of the tremendous uh, divide in terms of providing education to all folks. At the end of the 19th century, universities start uh, popping up to service uh, those individuals who were enslaved. And they didn't have a place to go. Typically, HBCUs began because of the challenges of African Americans going into college. And they were created so that they would provide education because it was a belief that education was the pathway to better outcomes, mobility, social, economic. I want you all to um, talk amongst yourselves in your group, and you can um, write this down. This can be one of your deliverables. I want you to give me a working definition of racism. When black students come to an HBCU, they know they're going to be surrounded by students that look like them. They know they're going to have opportunities that are culturally relevant. I think they're going to be educated for the most part in a way that is decolonized. And so just the level of comfort that I have and the sense of pride in the history that is connected um, with the space is really important when you think about um, why many of these institutions were founded to create a space when no other space was created for us. So we had to create our own. Most HBCUs are located in neighborhoods like where we are located here, where they're predominantly with minority neighborhoods. And that actually creates an opportunity for HBCUs to really have impact um, in the cities and communities in which they're located. <laughs> There's been a, um, a classic, what's called the town and gown mentality that you have the university here and the town here, and never the twain shall meet. And I think that's a very unfortunate, and that's a very missed experience. CSAM is a center that is really dedicated to understanding why our county um, is third from the bottom in economic mobility in the entire country. Um, it's an interesting paradox because we are also voted one of the best cities to live in in the uh, entire country. CSIM it is about uh, our community. It's about our zip codes, our place, our space. And so we're trying to understand the reasons and uh, issues that have created two Winston-Salem's. The history of our city, um, it was a tobacco town and folks did well in tobacco, and we became dependent. And this plantation mentality developed in Winston that all we do is depend on our master rentals. And then when that industry went away, that, you know, that middle class, it's gone. And so now you had the haves and the have-nots. Our city is bisected by Route 52, which runs north and south through the city. Um, it is a four-lane highway. It is nearly impossible to cross on foot, um, except for a few bridges, but it's not pedestrian friendly. So what it really does is it, it separates the, the city um, geographically. It also separates the city uh, racially and economically. 
Talk to most people in this city, and they'll tell you about East Winston and West Winston. They'll tell you about Highway 52. And we're talking about huge historical uh, issues in this city, about, you know, racial divide. Our university, of course, is located on the east side around all the other places that were impacted by the highway. And, and now our university is the, the largest resource in the east side of our city. And we knew our community had the issue of if you were born poor in our county, you were going to be poor basically for the rest of your life. How do we change opportunities for residents who, who live right around the corner from, from the university. For me, it's really about centering the perspective of people that are not invited to these conversations. How are you doing? To actually go into the community and talk to the people who are impacted and listening to them, most importantly, about what they perceive their, their struggles are in terms of access. You think it was a big adjustment for what? For high school? Like, it was some things I had to get used to, like, with the teachers. And then us, as the scholars, can use our resources to try to help better and improve um, or address their concerns, as they have highlighted, instead of us highlighting what we think they're concerned about. That's a big connector to this whole problem. When you look at the ladder of economic mobility, there are rungs to the ladder. And part of the, uh, that American dream that we talk about means that the rungs have to be something you can step on. So if we see people who aren't ascending, it does not mean they're not trying, potentially. What it does mean is that those rungs of that ladder are not even there. It is everyone's responsibility to begin to move into those spaces around equity for all of our citizens because I'm optimistic about human beings and human, you know, humankind, because I think that's the nature of who we are. So I'm not pessimistic. There are signs that we can do it. Uh, I just, and I think that we're one of the institutions that are playing a significant impact in doing that. And I think other institutions are beginning to see that as well. I have taken it as my personal charge uh, to make sure that our university does not forget uh, from whence we've come and be a good model for our campus and for our community, and, and, and really for other HBCUs as we move forward. The important criterion at a higher education institution, at a job, at life, is the ability to quickly be open to the possibility that A, I don't have the answer, or B, what I think is the answer or the truth may in fact not be the truth or the answer. And being able to recognize that quickly, embrace that as an opportunity, and to pivot accordingly. That's the skill that an institution should engender, encourage, and admit when they're looking for students, irrespective of the quote-unquote academic preparedness that classically has been assigned to students through the post-World War II testing mechanisms, the SAT and the ACT scores. We need to pay attention to the most important skill, this most important skill, which is a person's willingness to learn, their receptivity to new information, their ability to grasp new information, to appreciate it and to adopt it accordingly. The kind of questions that you're gonna be asked on an SAT test are not necessarily the kind of problems that a kid in Compton, LA is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But that capacity that the Compton kid has to absorb new information and react to it and appreciate it and to admit that he or she is wrong and pivot quickly may be a skill that the rich kid with a high SAT score doesn't have. My passion for engineering started when I was probably two, three years old. My parents would take me to the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas. And in the lobby of the Cosmosphere, they have a SR-71 Blackbird hanging from the ceiling. And I remember falling in love with that airplane and 
just deciding that I was gonna be a part of something that big too. Nobody in my family has gone to college. I am the first. First gen students come into um, universities with their eyes wide open, their hearts full and wanna do really great things. Um, but the reality is that they are not um, prepared like other students. They don't have the same information that other college students might have. When I was younger, I didn't feel that there was anything helping me be an engineer. I remember in middle school, I remember hearing my teacher saying, you shouldn't be an engineer because your math isn't that good. And it's more likely that you'll get pregnant in high school than become an engineer. So that just kind of, I felt shot down. When I'm working with our first generation students, um, I talk about them and to them about being entrepreneurs. The fact that they are entrepreneurs, they are innovators by being the first person in their family to come to college. You know, it's not just about them looking backwards and being the first person in their family to come here. It's about charting a whole new course for their future and future generations of their family. That's entrepreneurialism, that's, that's innovation. About 47% of our students are overall first gen students. And that is because of our demographic of our state, but also just our city itself has more blue collar roots to it. And so you're gonna see more people who are coming from families who didn't go to college. Wichita is the air capital of the world. 50 years ago, one in three planes in the air were built in Wichita, Kansas. A lot of what we do in this college is trying to make sure that the community stays ahead of that and make sure that we're preparing students not for riveting sheet metal, but the digital discipline that it's becoming. So the Walter H. Beach Wind Tunnel was built in 1948 at the tail end of World War II. It initially served as a university facility. Now we test for defense companies, a lot of government things. Thought it was so awesome that here at Heartland of the United States of America, I can make a difference around the world because I see things here that people won't see for the next 30 years. You know, we're 40% first gen in this campus, which is high. And, and we're also a top 100 engineering grad program. And, and we're ranked tied with flagship schools like KU and Mizzou and Nebraska and Kentucky. And they're 14% first gen. So, so we're this unique hybrid where we can really give students opportunities that they wouldn't have elsewhere. Depending on the student and their need, I'm a counselor sometimes. Um, I have to do triage for some students at times and connect them with campus resources, tutoring, even food banks. I mean, it's not a, a big surprise to anyone in this country that public education's been slowly being defunded um, at the state level. You know, it used to be 70% of our budget came from the state, now it's more like 20%, 25%. So we've partnered with um, private industry. We have a number of um, manufacturing companies here. We have Textron Aviation, Bombardier, Spirit, Airbus, and all of them pretty much have now uh, a presence on our campus. Providing this unique opportunity for students who get real world experience the moment they step on this campus, as even as a freshman, um, is, is huge. To not have to travel across the state or across the country to get a good quality internship experience, but to literally be able to walk next door, that's a game changer. The citizens in the state they don't have any appetite for us raising tuition. The state of Kansas does not provide any dollars for providing infrastructure, new facilities. I don't know where it ends. I, I really don't. Um, given the fact that, that, that no one wants to really budge on this. So we can do all kinds of things of shifting around resources and that's what we do every year um, to try to make this work for students. We have to effectuate a circumstance where the value system of the entire higher education ecosystem is looking up to institutions like the University of California system or Winsome-Salem State or Wichita State. 
that see it as their responsibility and mission to deliver education across the economic spectrum. We're in a competition for the value system around higher education. What's the value system that drives what we consider to be good in higher education? We need to change the system that favors wealth in higher education to a value system that favors providing opportunity irrespective of family income, irrespective of family wealth. I don't believe that the problem can be solved by philanthropy. It's great that wealthy people have the money to do good things, but it's a little bit like counting on the beneficent monarch. The problem with the monarchy, the problem with philanthropy as a solution is that it says it's okay for the decisions about how economic power is distributed or allocated to be concentrated in the hands of a few. And in a democratic society, that does not match up. One way to providing public financing is called a public option. For example, the U.S. Postal Service is a public option to Federal Express or UPS. Another approach is called a market subsidy. That's when, for example, you provide food stamps for citizens, not telling them where to buy food. It doesn't really matter whether they go to Safeway or Kroger or Fred Meyers. What we have right now in higher education is a market subsidy. We're saying the system is virtuous. It doesn't really matter where that money ends up. The problem with this is that it ends up supporting institutions that are doing very little addressing social mobility. We are misspending our money, allowing it to be dispersed, undifferentiated to institutions that are tantamount to educational country clubs. Country clubs are fine, but public money shouldn't be doled out to cover membership dues. But that's exactly what we're doing through our undifferentiated tax exemptions and tuition subsidies to higher education. We are throwing $84 billion annually at a racist, non-inclusive system. Why should the endowment of a college be tax exempt if the college is not admitting, educating, and graduating students across the economic spectrum? Why should public monies underwrite tuition payments to colleges that are not educating people evenly across the economic spectrum? Make tuition free, but set the proper bar for the benefit. Grant tax exemptions for endowments, but set the proper bar. And the proper bar would be a school that admits, educates, and graduates students evenly across the economic spectrum. To do otherwise is to perpetuate a system that widens the economic divide. Education equals encouraging persistence and patience in the struggle. The struggle is essential to firing change in neuronal connections. We know this from brain research, that when people play at the edges of their capability, that's when they're most likely to advance. That's when they're most likely to learn. To learn means to struggle. We're calling upon universities to do just that, to struggle with their role in society, to struggle with their role in the American dream.